everyone and welcome! Last time I presented you with 10 facts you didn't know about League, to my surprise it was very successful. I told you to dislike the video in case you knew all 10 facts. And even now we are nearing 200,000 views and only 340 dislikes. So I managed to successfully show you something new. And today I want to continue that. The rules are the same. In this video I wanna show you 10 facts you can't find in any other video. And in case you somehow knew about all 10 of them, feel free to dislike it. Hopefully there will be at least one new thing for you again. So without further ado, let's get started. You may have noticed that all the champions with old models got new textures to hide those ugly polygons. It is incredible how well a texture can hide low resolution models. The combination of good shadows and highlights together with more details can bring a new life to an old model. Perfect example is Cho'Gath. His model wasn't changed at all. Underneath this newly painted skin is still that good old year 2009 model. But did you know that some of these textures had to be hotfixed in order to match the new lore? For example, Malzahar lost his summoner mage runes to bind him to the new world where summoners don't exist. Corky used to have runes on his propellers as well. These are gone too since rune magic isn't practiced in Piltover. Akali's tattoos and clothing marks were removed possibly to cut loose all connections to other ninja families. This was probably done to support the fact that her one true mentor is Shen. But most importantly, Riven finally got her Noxian mark fixed. Even after Riven received her texture update, she still had the old Noxian ergot style mark on her shoulder. But thankfully in the next patch cycle, Riot decided to fix this little detail that would seriously confuse anyone who knows anything about her story. So after that patch rolled out, she finally got her true Noxian crest where it belongs. Bonus fact, Crimson Elite Talon and Riven both kept the old Noxian skull since both of these skins were based on the old story. The Pentakill band seems to get a new member every few years. It began with lead guitar, a singer, bass guitar and harf? Maybe she's the rhythm guitar. But before Pentakill got its vocalist Kale, they got Olaf as their drummer. And since the Pentakill skin line is one of the favorite amongst Riot, of course Pentakill Olaf had to include some easter eggs. This skin hides two unique features. As you may have noticed, his Q will make a drum noise every time it hits an enemy. But what you may not know is that the lightning generated by his E hides the old Pentakill text logo. It is there only for two frames, so it is really hard to see. So even though the Pentakill band now has a brand new look, the old version will stay with us forever. Speaking of old versions, some of you may remember the original League of Legends theme music. And those of you who remember it, you may also know that with every new event and login screen, Riot remade this theme to fit that event. My favorite cover Riot released was the Christmas version with fiddlesticks. But did you know that Riot wanted this to be a thing for every champion they released? Their plan was to make a login screen for every new champion and to make a cover of the theme for each and every one of them. Funnily enough, this new tradition held on for only two releases. It started with Lulu's cover in March 2012. and ended with Hecarim's cover in April 2012. One month later, Varus was released and he had his own unique piece of music, just like every other champion released after him. This tradition was most likely discontinued because the theme could never fit some of the champions they were working on. Just imagine trying to fit their main theme into Draven style. 
We all know Pulsefire Ezreal as the first ultimate skin that made every child find a way to buy RP. And while at the time this skin was an incredible piece of digital non-existent pile of pixels, at this moment Pulsefire Ezreal is hardly challenging some of the cheaper skins of current days. But did you know that Pulsefire Ezreal was in development for years before his release? In fact, some of the earlier versions got released on PBE, only to be scrapped and worked on for another year. The original name for this skin was Cyber Ezreal, and the first asset that got to the public was his splash art. Riot would sometimes test a splash art on the PBE without giving it an actual skin to buy. This is what happened to the very old Knight Mordekaiser concept. We never saw more than just the store art. So this is what Pulsefire Ezreal was supposed to be. And Riot followed that idea as they released the model on PBE as well. As you can see, the model was just a classic future Indiana Jones styled Ezreal, with a battery drive on his back. But Riot wasn't happy with it and they took it down. And the more they worked on the skin, the higher the quality went. One year later, the real Pulsefire Ezreal was born. There are many items in the game that hold some value to the world and the story of League of Legends. There are bigger and more obvious items like Blade of the Ruined King which has its own story, Iceborne Gauntlet which was renamed from Frozen Fist to connect with the new Freljordian story, or Locket of the Iron Solari. But there are many other items that have tiny connections to the world. It is very hard to catch all of them, so here are a few examples. Randuin's Omen is a Damasian shield bearing Damasian crown crest. The same goes for Ages of the Legion, it is marked with the same crest. Black Lever is a Noxian war axe, crafted from typical Noxian black runed metal. Righteous Glory is very closely resembling Damasian armor, just like King's Vow, but here the steel is more bluish grey which is not typical for patricide color. Prospector's Ring, which used to be a basic item in Dominion, appeared in Tariq's rework, which means that Tariq could possibly be this Prospector. Sunfire Cave was turned into a Shuriman armor when its icon got updated. Death's Dance could be a Darkin weapon, since it appears to have an eye on it. And then we have all the support items, which are based on one of three regions, Freljord, Shurima and Targon. The Freljordian and Shuriman items are obvious. But Targon has a sneakier reference here. Face of the Mountain is based on Mount Targon. The item's appearance is based on Targon's main crest. The Eye of Equinox, however, is based on Equinox as in the astronomical event. This is a reference to the real Targon spreading throughout the cosmos. It seems like Riot is trying to make the game interact with the story more with each champion. Every other new champion has more lines than the one before. I remember when champions used to have 2 minutes worth of dialogue, but now we are getting near the 50 minutes mark. But did you know that Riot used to be against the idea of champions interacting with each other that often? The first two pairs of champions with special interactions were Zillion and Volibear, and Rengar and Kha'Zix. When asked why there weren't more interactions like these, Riot replied that it wouldn't feel that special when these interactions occurred. If everyone had unique voice lines against all other champions, no one's interactions would be unique in the end. They even mentioned games like Dota where these interactions were very common. That's why they added them in at the minimum, just like Aatrox having one taunt against Rindamir. That way, whenever something like this would happen, it would feel unique. However, as years passed, Riot realized that these voice lines are a great way to bind their champions to the world so the number of special interactions grew, and now we have way more than we could ever wish for. While we can see a lot of unique monsters around Summoner's Rift, Rune Terra hides a lot more. And since some of these monsters have already reappeared in stories before, I recommend learning about them so you can be the smart guy getting all the references. I want to show you some of the lesser known species that roam around the world. So let's avoid the bigger ones like the Vastaya or the Brekern. Each region of Valoran has its own variety of fauna. Shurima has a lot of special goats and horses. The goats usually have ancient Shuriman names like the Ekasul or Ral Sejai. These local beasts are used as donkeys to transport cargo through the boiling heat of Shurima. 
Shuriman horses, however, come from a different land. These horses are bred in Noxus. They are thin and light, which makes it easier for them to run in sand. Damasia has a variety of strange magical monsters around its edges. For example, in Shivana's story, we learned about a strange gargoyle-like creature with claws and fangs, but with a naked wrinkly face like a rat or a human. But there are also the giant dangerous crag beasts. These were mentioned in many different places, like in Galio's story or in Poppy's comic. Freljord is full of normal goats and sheep, since shepherds are quite common around the borders. But when it comes to the other dangerous beasts, there aren't that many that we know of. Of course, there are the trolls and shapeshifters. The shapeshifters are hybrid beings which can change their appearance. They are something between an animal and a human, just like Vastaya. They can also be possibly bound to dark magic. It is speculated that the Ursine are shapeshifters devoted to the demigod Volibear. But outside of that, that's pretty much it. Ionia, on the other hand, is full of weird, magical and dangerous beings. Most of them are bound to the Vastaya. Here I would recommend reading the Eduard Sant'Angelo's Vastaya Field Journal. There are way too many species in Ionia to cover in this video. Ionia is pretty much the Australia of Runeterra. And finally, I want to mention the creatures of Bilgewater. We know that the Kraken creatures are not a myth. They are large serpent-like beasts with tentacles. One of them was even slain and brought back as an undead in the Shadow and Fortune story. But Bilgewater is also plagued by the Wafthreds, which appeared in the game during the Bilgewater event. We know them as razor fins. When they are alone, they are not that dangerous. But they become unstoppable if they swarm you. They appeared in pretty much every Bilgewater story, so I just wanted to show you what they look like. Also, there is a baby version of them on the Butcher's Bridge. Did you know that there is a reason why Demon Blade Trindamir has the same base animations as all the other skins? Not counting his emotes, you may have noticed that Demon Blade Trindamir is using the same running and attack animations as the base skins, despite it being a legendary skin. Back in the day, Trindamir used to have different animations. You can see them in the old League of Legends trailers. He used to carry the blade slightly on his side instead of dragging it directly behind him. Also, when he was standing still, he was holding it casually. When Riot updated his base model, they decided to reuse the newly fleshed out animations from his Demon Blade skin. That's why every Trindamir skin today is dragging the blade behind him as if it was fused with his arm. You may not have noticed it, but now you won't be able to unsee it. Did you know that the word Pentakill is trademarked by Riot? In fact, as of today, there is a second trademark currently pending. The one filled in 2017 is focused on audio. This is obviously referring to the band Pentakill. But there is also an old trademark active from 2012. This one is simply aimed at computer and video game software. This one was highly likely filled so no other game could also use Pentakill. Or, to be precise, the word Pentakill. Because as you can see, unlike double, triple or quadrakill, Pentakill is one word. Because Riot holds the rights to use it as one word. So the question is, if other games want to use Pentakill, can they just use it as two separate words? And for the last fact on this list, I want you to join me on a browsing adventure. Did you know that every now and then Riot holds an art contest? Here artists can showcase their concept art, 3D modeling and special effects talents. These contests are aimed to work for both sides. The artists can show off their talents and they are possibly letting companies to discover them. And on the other side, Riot gets an array of inspiration with the chance of hiring one of these amazing artists. I am going to link the contest on Polygon in the description and I want you to look around. There are seriously amazing ideas that I want to see in League one day. Here are my favorite entries. Under character art we can find Baron Kogmo, Malphite update and my absolute favorite Cho'gath update. Seriously, you start as a small spawn and grow with stacks. The model even evolves. And by the way, all of these have functional 3D models. Then under environment art we have Overgrown Inhibitor, Base Guardian Turrets, 
and these amazing harrowing themed turrets and monster lairs. I just highly recommend browsing this place. There are some insanely talented artists here. But that's it for this list. Remember, in case you knew about everything in this video, feel absolutely free to give it a dislike. The purpose of this video was to show you something league related which you didn't already know. I would hate to just repeat what was said in other videos many times before. But that's it for this video. So if you enjoyed it, feel free to rate it however you want and subscribe for some lore and other educational stuff. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Discord if you'd like to chat. Merch and second channel will be in the description. And of course I have to thank our patrons for their amazing support. Just thank you guys for going the extra mile. And to the rest of you, thank you all so much for being here and for your support, you know I really appreciate it. And as always, thank you come again.